JC, welcome to the Fitter podcast. Although, I mean, this is your podcast, so I should actually be saying thanks for having us. It's ours. It's ours, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so a few weeks back, you know, even you know about this, uh, Nusair from Nas Daily called you India's yeah. fittest CEO. Yeah. And since then, people have been asking me, you know, you really know this guy? You really work for him? How is he? What does he do every single day? So I thought, why not put you in the hot seat today sure. and ask you about you? So tell us about you. Yeah, founder of Fitter. Yeah. I'm um, 37 years old, mm -hmm. stay with my family, my wife, my daughter and my three little dogs in Pune for the last 10 years. Right. And I come from Pulaha, which is a small village in uh, the middle of Madhya Pradesh. Background is in engineering. I've, I've worked with IT companies for about eight years and before I accidentally started Fitter. Right. Like you rightly pointed out. So we started a small WhatsApp group back in 2014, 2015 and started training five people, my friends and family members and they got fit. They told other people, other people told other people, moved from WhatsApp to Facebook, wrote Get Shredder document. And then, yeah, like when more people started asking me if I could personally train them, that's when we came up with the idea, hey, I don't want to train you. Mm -hmm. I can educate you. Maybe you can train others, right? So it's like a curated marketplace for uh, coaches and community. So if you need any sort of help with regards to your fitness queries, mm -hmm. we're there for you. And it's completely free, of course. But if you need any sort of assistance with regards to, let's say, personalized coaching, accountability, or you know, somebody who can do your work, so that's when you enroll with a coach. That's how we make money. Now, the question most people ask me is: This guy is India's fittest CEO. How does he do it? And what they want to know is: What do you do in a day? So, can you just take us through a typical day in the life of JC, from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep? What is it that drives you to stay fit? Right. So, I wouldn't say it's a constant. Much like everything else in my life, my routine is constantly evolving. And I would say that over a period of time, I've become more and more efficient at my routines, right? Uh, there was a time when I used to work out for, let's say, two, two and a half hours every day. Um, there was a time when I was constantly uh, eating super clean foods, which was also upsetting me. Uh, mentally, because what do you it's mean by super clean, super clean, which means egg whites, boiled eggs, boiled vegetables, just the basics. It's just the basics. Um, even and and back then I was a non-vegetarian, right? So I was sticking to a lot of boiled stuff, and it was mentally very taxing, mentally very draining to stick to such a very such a difficult routine. Restrictive yeah, but back then I I didn't know any better, right? So right now I'm in a much more comfortable zone where I eat food, which is my comfort food, even though, you know, from a lot of people's standards, it's still comparatively bland and monotonous. But I've come to a point where I'm in a very good relationship with my food, like where I don't crave stuff. Mm. And there's no there's no craving in life. Like I, my, my diet is such that I don't crave stuff. Similarly, you know, my workouts are not mentally taxing. They are data driven. I enjoy working out every single day. And every time I go to the gym, like, I feel like, oh yeah, this is something I did yesterday. I have to break this number. So everything is milestone, number, goals. So those two hour workouts are gone? Nowadays it's gone. Uh, if I'm going to learn some sort of a skill in the future, which requires uh, the amount of time and dedication, probably they'll come back. More than two hours. There was a time when I was training for four to five hours uh, last year when I was in Phuket. And wow. uh, I was training for Muay Thai. Mm. I was almost training for four hours per day, four to five hours easily. The question everyone actually also wants to know is, fine, there are a lot of people who are fit, but here is someone who likes being shredded, who prefers being shredded the whole year round. Yeah. And you've been actually busting these myths, you know, that you can be shredded throughout the year and still be healthy. A lot of people say that's not possible. How do you do it? No, staying shredded is actually healthy. A lot of people have this confusion because a lot of studies have been done on natural bodybuilders and they are like sitting at let's say 12%, 15% body fat. Mm -hmm. And for a contest, uh, they will try to cut down in a 16 week or let's say a 24 week period, they'll sharply cut down the body fat percentage. They're sitting at 12, 14% and then they'll cut it down to 6% now. Sharply cutting down requires you to punish yourself, you know, because that means that you're gonna go from, let's say suitable amount of calories to probably more aggressive amount of calories, which means that you're super aggressive with your workouts, right? So it's a change of pace. 
and body doesn't get comfortable with a change of pace. Every time you push your body uh, in a small period of time, the changes are extremely acute. Mm. It puts a lot of stress on your body, right? So it's not very sustainable. And when that happens, your body goes through a lot of hormonal um, imbalance, your test levels drop, your sleep cycle gets poorer, you know, you develop some sort of deficiencies. And this is what has been evidenced in the studies. Okay, so typically they are very the short duration. The drastic drop that we are talking about. Yes, that's yes. the, the short duration studies. Mm. But if you look at some of the most natural athletes and people who stay shredded uh, 365 days a year, Ronaldo, for instance, he maintains a 5-6% to body fat and he's been doing it for the last 12 years. Mm. You'd never see him out of shape. Most gymnasts, most Olympic level athletes, they are elite level athletes, right? So they have come to a point where their relationship with food and exercise and probably with their overall surroundings is much, much better, right? So you cannot superimpose findings from um, a contest prep athlete to in general uh, population or people who are like athletes in general, not, not bodybuilders, mm. okay? So that's a very, um, that's very wrong notion. And this is where most of the people derive the conclusion that getting shredded can probably put your testosterone levels down or something like that. My test levels have never been better. I constantly have like 840, 850 and last year it peaked to about 900 plus mm. uh, NG per deciliter, which is pretty good for a 37 year old guy. You, know? you don't look 37 by the way. Uh, thank you, I've been told that. <laughs> <laughs> so you keep, you mentioned your relationship with food a number of times. Yeah. Most people have a toxic relationship or a codependent relationship. I would say food is something you take out your frustration or yeah, you're happy yeah, you yeah. eat food, you are sad you eat food. Yeah. How would you define a good relationship with food and how does one build one? A simple example is let's say animals, hmm. you know, like uh, your dogs, your cats and I have three dogs so I know. Every time they eat their food, they're equally excited. You know, even though they are eating the same food over and over and over. So what is it? They're just so happy to see. They're just so happy to see food. They are just so happy to see us, the mm. same people. So humans have this natural tendency of getting spoiled by choices and start craving for variety. It's not really a nature. It's more of a question of nurture. Nurture, not nature. It's a question of our nurture. It's not in our nature to go for variety, but we are nurturing ourselves Got it. to kind of crave variety, to crave different people, crave different relationships, crave different stuff, you know. So we have to kind of put a resistance to all those feelings of wanting more, mm. you know, getting spoiled for choices. Once you start understanding uh, this basic principle, you know, things get much more simple and it applies to every single thing. Tell me. You work in a single job for 10 years versus you do 10 different jobs for 10 years. What do you think will be most rewarding at the end of 10 years? Well, sticking to a job, learning skills, applying skills. Exactly. You would be... Job hopping is like, like is bar hopping or food hopping. In exactly. Sense. Same applies to relationships. Mm. Would you rather be in a stable relationship where you and your partner grow together? Or would you like go from one relationship to another? It's the same with exercises, you know, I stick to the same kind of routine for a very long time. Similarly, I stick to similar kind of food, similar kind of clothes, everything in my life. If I keep some of the stuff same, it allows me to become more knowledgeable. So that's where I see growth in terms of the stuff that I know, in terms of the stuff that I do, not the stuff that's there and I'm happy with it, you know. So I'm not going to change my food, I'm not going to change my relationship. I'm not going to change my um, business, I'm not going to change my exercise, I'm not going to change my uh, food, you know, that's, that's how it is. So, sustainability, discipline, consistency, that's what I'm getting from what you say. Right. Right. Uh, unfortunately, even today, a lot of people think, are fitness though, it's only for rich people, they have the time, they have the resources. And yet you're saying you don't need anything that's fancy. Whether it's your diet, whether it's your exercise, learn the basics. Stick to the basics and yeah. that's it. Yeah. yeah. So tell and us about just your, a matter of time. Yeah. Just tell a us about your what are the basics in your life relating to diet, relating to exercise? Like I said, it has evolved over a period of time. It has become more and more efficient. Back in the days, it was more of weight training. Mm -hmm. I used to do really heavy weight training 
and all thanks to that, I have developed a lot of muscle mass. Um, now my exercise is more geared toward longevity, mm -hmm. more towards achieving a very high performance, which means speed and power, and uh, keeping myself below 10% body fat. So, you know, keeping my blood markers intact, because after a certain point of time, it's no longer about being the strongest guy in the room, but the guy who outlives, um, I'm not saying everybody else, <laughs> but hey, I'm, I might outlive the- Your resting heart rate is pretty low. Yes, it's around 46. Wow. Yeah, so it's it's about that. And then my, if you see my blood profile, my health report, it's also pretty good. My HDL, LDL levels are like almost the same. Mm. So um, it's about that, you know, and I realize that, you know, most of the people don't, uh, don't really care uh, about the youth uh, because that's, that's probably the most healthiest you are. The 20s to 30s right. is, is, the, is the peak period when you are the healthiest. And by the time, you realize that this period is not going to come back. back yeah. You're already, you know, touching your 30s and 40s and 50s. And then you start missing those periods back. And actually, you did not do anything mm. to make things better. Right. And I, I recognize this. I learned from other people's mistakes. And I probably was fortunate enough to experience some of the problems myself. I have hepatitis B. Uh, my brother has hepatitis B since we were kids. Okay. Um, I have osteoarthritis. And I had a very severe back injury, right? So it was almost like a life-threatening eye-opening. No one eye would say that. Incident. No one would assume that looking at you today. Yeah. You look like the picture of health, you know. So, I mean, <laughs> it is possible to overcome these health problems yes, just yes. by living a disciplined life. Uh, they, they still stay. Like, so I still have hepatitis B. It's mm. incurable, right? Mm. And hepatitis B will affect my kidneys in future. And I might develop cirrhosis or liver cancer, right? So the constant fear of, hey, if I don't keep my lifestyle in check, I might develop this, 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 right. right? I don't want to be in that place, you know? So every day it's the constant fear. And look, but a lot of people- But you don't let that fear cripple you no. or, you know, give up. No. That's not an option. No, not an option. Mm. I mean, you try giving up, what's, what's going to come out of it? You know, just by giving up on something that nothing good ever comes out by just giving up, mm. nothing. You can play the victim, sleep in a room, you know, drown yourself in tears of sorrows under a pillow. Nothing's going to change. You know, you wake up, you realize, oh shit, you know, I cried a bucket. Nothing mm. happened. Mm. You do that over and over again. And then, you know, weeks pass by, months go by. And then you realize that nothing is changing. Mm. Maybe this time instead of crying, let me try doing something else. And that's the magic moment. You know, I think everybody needs that magic moment. Um, when you've cried buckets of tears and you've done literally nothing for several months, hoping there's some sort of magic waiting to happen. It doesn't happen. That's your waking moment. That's when you realize that it's all us. The magic is within us. The magic we is within us. We've we got to pull it out. Yeah, it's very powerful. Yeah. So, uh, you also talk a lot about your philosophy. Uh, you, I remember a few years ago where you changed the definition of health. Or rather, you redefined it where you said health is not just physical, yeah. but also mental, emotional, social and financial. Yeah. Tell us a bit about this philosophy. Some of the healthiest people, healthiest athletes aren't really happy. I mean, physically they're happy, but mentally they are burdened by different kinds of problems. Mm. They're not happy in their relationships or they're not happy financially. And I just realized, hey, what's the point of me becoming so physically fit, but constantly worried about my family, my finances, my emotional health, you know? And then I just started searching about it, started looking about it. Then I formulated a hypothesis that it has to be a culmination of all of these things. I mean, it's not really happiness, happiness that we seek, but we seek meaning in life. And for somebody to be able to appropriately seek meaning in life, they need to check the four boxes before they look, go look further. You know, because most of the people today, you'd see they are sorrowed either because of the four things. Right. Either they're physically unwell, or they are mentally unwell, they're emotionally unwell, or they are financially unwell. Unless until you overcome these things, you cannot really look beyond. And looking beyond is basically searching, you know, finding the true meaning of who we are, mm. of why are we here, you know. And I, I sincerely believe that everybody who kind of ticks these boxes, they start on a journey mm -hmm. which is over and above their own journey, then they start making a positive difference to the world. And where does this, where should this journey begin? For a lot of people I know, they say, you know, financial 
fitness or financial health is more important to me. So let me first achieve that. The rest can be tackled that's, later. That's what has. That's what most of the people have been conditioned to believe since childhood, and that's why you'd see a financially rich guy and ask him, "Hey, you earn so much money. Are you happy?" And that's it. Money doesn't make you happy. Right. They know what they're talking about. They're absolutely right. Money doesn't make you happy. Money is something that can help you with comfort, but it is not comfort that you seek. You seek meaning, you know. And comfort is the opposite of meaning. The more you seek comfort, the more meaningless your life becomes. So where does one start this journey? Let's say you have these four goals: physical, mental, emotional, and financial freedom. Yeah. Do you tackle all them, all of them together? or do you prioritize one over the other what is the approach you would suggest the first thing is discipline without discipline you can't do any of the stuff set out time for specific things in a day mm. it could be you know like working out for 15 minutes not necessarily 2 hours it could be reading a book maybe read 10 pages of a book every single day mm. so and nothing ever nothing good ever is going to happen in a matter of let's say one day or one week or maybe even 10 weeks you know most of the people who are millionaires or billionaires bearing a few exceptions are people who are probably in their mid 30s mid 40s mid 50s mm. even mid 60s or 70s you know it takes time there's a pattern we have to understand that this is how the world works not the people mm. these are just universal principles so first thing is you have to incorporate some sort of discipline in your life and by discipline most of the people think hey maybe i ought to wake up at 6 in the morning and sleep nine at uh, sleep early at night and that's 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 probably discipline no that's not discipline discipline is you committing to something long enough even when it gets tiring you keep repeating it and you mm-hmm. keep doing it over and over and over again and i think that brings in perspective that's when you truly realize how the universe works the universe works through repetition and compounding hmm. so every time you repeat something you learn something about yourself and about the things it's crazy so it's not about setting a goal and trying whatever you do to achieve that goal but creating those systems that enable yes. that journey yes so coming to fitter how has fitter been enabling this journey for people when we do have coaches mm-hmm. um i try and incorporate the same value system same uh you know the goal based uh, the you know like physical mental social and financial well being the whole system um into the coaches um library i actively participate in how fitter is rendering information the first uh part is basically educating people that hey it's not just about physical fitness i mean it is because a lot of people are struggling with physical fitness today more than anything else right so in a way it's about physical fitness but also educating them that along with physical fitness it also has far reaching effects on your other areas right because financial fitness probably requires a uh, discipline which most of the people have but when it comes to physical and mental fitness and relational fitness um you know relationships most people are simply not taught enough All right so once you start learning about physical fitness you'd see that the value system the 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 principles they apply to everything else too so once you start getting physically fitter you realize that hey i'm also getting mentally fitter you know things are becoming more and more clear so we don't just teach people how to get physically fit but apply the same systems to other aspects of their life right and that's 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 my intention that we create a society which is not just physically fit Hmm. physical fitness should be a way to achieve mental phys- mental social and financial fitness it's about integral growth and not integral growth and holistic silos, growth right? yes yes so where do you see fitter going with this or enabling this because you're saying it's not just about physical fitness but about enabling people on their journeys in, in improving their lives what's the vision what's the plan ahead well, the plan is to continue educating people the importance of well-being and uh, hoping that by imparting the knowledge about physical well-being and teaching them how it's not just about physical fitness it has far reaching effects the same principles apply to all aspects of your life be it mental social financial but the foundation has to be like some sort of rooted in physical fitness right 
because if you're not physically fit, there's no way you're going to be mentally fit. If you're not mentally fit, social and emotional fitness and probably financial fitness will also kind of become market distant dream. So it's like, you know, helping people check the boxes. Helping them through maybe a podcast like this as well. Sure. Yeah. If they are willing to listen. <laughs> I hope so. Because I think we've got something really excellent lined up for the coming episodes. Yep. You talked about education, you talked about mindset and that's yep. exactly what we are going to be covering in future episodes. So that was it for this episode of the Fitter Podcast. Do tune in next week because as JC said, we are going to talk about education and mindset, which are the pillars of physical fitness. And we are going to address something that has been plaguing a lot of people or I would say messing with people's heads for a very long time and that's their diet. Tune in next week where we talk about what you need to be doing to get physically fit and charting the journey for the rest of your life. Thanks for watching.